Billy, Billy, I'm mad at you. You didn't, you didn't call me back this week. Yeah, you, Billy. I called you twice this week. I was handing out $100 bills. I thought you might want one. All right, L Lauren, are we on? Yes. All right. Well, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, this is uh, Life Issues. We are here at Heartland Baptist Fellowship, and we have a ministry that's an outreach to the addicted, and uh, we're thankful you're here, we're thankful you're joining us online, and uh, it's going to be a good night. So welcome, everybody. I don't have too many announcements. I know uh, Brother Rich, I think, graduated from the Joshua House this week. Does that sound right? I seen a picture. Yeah. So we are so proud of our brother Rich, and I think he's. Hang What's that? Did I miss somebody? We're proud of uh, Kaylee got into the Lily House. Uh, yeah. And uh, her and I think Thomas will be here tonight too. Uh, her and Thomas got baptized this week. As well as, uh, Ashley. Ashley. Ashley, that's the one I'm missing. So, uh, yeah. Hey, Callie Tally, uh, these two girls want to talk with you later just about Lily House. And uh, I don't know if we have an intake form or not, but anyway, at least one of them's interested and in maybe candidate. So, uh, Anyway, so we got a couple new folks tonight, so we're glad you girls are here. Welcome, and uh, Chris, can we get them a, a gift? We have a little gift bag, and we're about out, so we got to bake some more, so forgive us if we don't have enough. Well, we do. Okay. There's a little red card in there. If you don't mind filling out your name and just giving the card to me, that way I'll have your contact information. So yeah, there's a Bible and some Tootsie Roll. There's an ink pen, and there's a red card. If you find the red card and don't mind filling it out while we're talking... Uh, so you might notice a little bit of decorations around here. I didn't know they were going to hang these, but uh, these are for our vision conference, sewing, shepherding, sending, sending, shepherding, sewing. So there's kind of the same words, but so anyway, that's cool. So this week, tomorrow, nope, Sunday, tomorrow is Pastor Jim's funeral service at one o'clock. And I think the family's going to be here around 12 if you want to get a jump on uh, hugging on them so uh, but the funeral will be at one o'clock tomorrow here at the church and there's going to be a big dinner they're going to feed everybody afterwards so if you want to stick around it's not just for the family it's for uh, all the I think uh, you know Pastor Jim was uh, at the Kansas City Baptist Temple you know 15 years before he came here and he was here 15 years so anyway uh, Jim's got a, good, a lot of good uh, friends and Loved ones from around the whole Kansas City area. So there'll be some guests here. So if you can stay for dinner. Uh, last I heard, they're cooking for 350 people. And this sanctuary only holds 290. So we, we were thinking we have overflow rooms and we may put tables up in the parking lot. We don't know what we're going to do. But anyway, you can stay and eat if you want. So that's tomorrow. And then Sunday morning starts our vision conference. And does anybody know who our guest speaker is? Lee, Lee, Carter. Lee Carter, two people guessed it. Brian, go sit in the corner. <laughs> Lee Carter, no, that was Jimmy Carter was president. I don't think they're related. So anyway, Lee Carter is a missionary to the Dominican Republic, and he is a true evangelist. And so... Uh, Brian's bringing him in to prime the pump. We need uh, people to get excited about witnessing and sharing our faith. And uh, people need the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, uh, let me just read the verse that's really uh, resonating. I don't have a lot of announcements. Uh, uh, let me read you a verse here. Because I teach a Sunday school class uh, called The Foundation. And, oh, I'm already in the verse here, so... <clears throat> the very last verse of Jeremiah chapter 8, it says, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? 
And it's kind of a rhetorical question because, yes, there is balm in Gilead. And, yeah, there's lots of doctors there. And then he says, why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? And just, it uses the word recovered. And I thought, you know, gosh, with, with Joshua House, with, uh, you know, Lily House, with uh, meetings like ours, there's people willing to help people recover. Why are there so many addicts? And I really believe the answer to that question is the same answer. to It's that people's heart are not toward the Lord. And I, I don't mean to be judgmental because my heart hasn't always been toward the Lord. I'm just saying, in general, these 30 people that I'm talking to right now represent 300 in Harrisonville right now, tonight, that are doing something they shouldn't do, Right. So we're just scratching the surface, and but it, it's a heart thing, because you know uh, I struggled with tithing, and and <clears throat> because we hang on to things, but w once God got my heart, He had my money. You know what I'm saying? W once He's got your heart, it you know last weekend was Easter that we we celebrate Christ raising from the dead. If God can raise Jesus from the dead and bring life to the dead, He can help you with your drug addiction. He can help you with whatever immorality, uh, life issue you have, He can help that. He's, he's got the balm of Gilead, it's the salve, it's, He wants to anoint and heal, and He is the great physician, amen? And so, but He, he wants our heart, so that, that's kind of my conclusion to that verse jeremiah is like you know why why have we got this salve and all these doctors around and nobody's recovered well their heart is not toward the lord theirs wasn't and uh i think that's the case in our land too so let me just uh we'll say our pledge i guess we got the verse up there good job dale <clears throat> and uh i don't think we'll just take a prayer request tonight i want to give chris is going to speak to us tonight uh, you all are invited to our vision conference. Uh, starts Sunday morning at 10.30. And uh, it'll be Sunday night at 6 o'clock. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday will be 6.30 in the evening. So Sunday night 6, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday 6.30. And then Monday and Tuesday there's some daytime sessions if you want to come to those. Uh, everybody's welcome to those too. So there's food at all that. So if you can, if you want some, come and eat some good food and have some good fellowship. You do have a prayer request? Who? Oh, Joe. He's got Parkinson's. He's in the hospital. Well, let's do. We'll, we'll pray for him. And So let, let's stand and say our pledge to the Bible. And uh, we'll pray for Joe and uh, all others. So I pledge allegiance to the Bible. God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. <clears throat> Let's uh, remain standing. We'll pray together. Lord, uh, we do come before your throne of grace to find help in time of need. And Father, uh, we, we've all come from different places in life and different places in the community to uh, be here tonight and we we just pledged our allegiance to you and your word and we thank you that it is a light in darkness lord we we live in darkness and and father we want to uh petition you and intercede on behalf of our brother joe i know he's a saved man and he's suffering with parkinson uh, brian just informed us and so we lift him up by name and i know there's uh some mamas here that are hurting for their boys and their kids and we lift that up to you, and maybe there's some that are struggling. They're just kind of Jones in here tonight, uh, not sure what to think. Uh, but Lord, uh, help them to make the next right step. And Father, be with your servant Chris as he uh, speaks your word to us. And uh, Lord, uh, help help our hearts to be turned toward you, and not not like the Israelites from Jeremiah's day that uh, were facing judgment. Lord, we. We need mercy. We, we don't need justice. We, we need mercy. So, Lord, be with him and uh, help him to give us something we can uh, take home with us and uh, be changed from me having been here tonight. Uh, in Jesus' name. And I also want to just thank you uh, for the vision conference coming up. Just the time that our church can come together and 
got somebody out there mowing the grass tonight and people in the kitchen cooking food and getting ready and just there's kind of excitement building and so Lord help us not to uh, miss out on what you'd have for us at the vision conference and ask all this in Jesus name amen, amen. all right we'll just be seated and uh, turn Facebook over to Chris all right I usually take this on here yeah but... you want me to get some I think it'll be okay Yeah. All right. Good evening. Good evening. So, Dale. See, so it's a good Friday, right? Last Friday was a good Friday, but every Friday is a good day, and so every day's every day is a good day, right? <laughs> well, they say they they call it Good Friday, and when, but every day that the Lord makes is a good day. So that we're, we're glad to be here. I'm thankful for everybody to be here tonight, and. Uh, so you know the Bible is, is full of some amazing and sometimes unbelievable stories, which they're really not stories. You know, we think of a story of, you know, a, a fiction book that you read and something that's kind of made up or something. But these are real events that's really happened in the Bible. You know, God's Word is true. And so the, the Bible is, is a history book. You know, this stuff that happened in the Old Testament and all these crazy things that happened, it's real. You know, and sometimes it's hard to believe, but it's just like in this room, I imagine that there's a lot of things that's happened in our life that if you were to tell some people some of the things that God has done in your life, people just wouldn't believe it, right? That we hear some amazing testimonies. We hear one at the end of every month. We just heard a good one on, in March, and we'll hear another one at the end of April. But sometimes when we tell people our testimony, they just think that it's a fairy tale or a fable or something that's made up. And uh, that's the same way that people believe about the Bible. They think these things in the, in the Bible are just some stories that are just made up and they're not really real. But that's not the case. It is real. And so, you know, there are some hard things in the Bible to understand, but they're pretty easy to believe when you understand how big our God is, right? And so we, don't, we might not understand everything that takes place, but we got to be able to believe it. And that's the thing. We got to simply take God's word for what it says and we got to believe what it says. So can anybody think of any passages in the Bible that are just like far-fetched stories that you would think that, you know, only God can do this? What do you got, Kevin? The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, there you go. The guy's in a fiery furnace that didn't get burned up, right? Connie? What story is that? What are we looking at? Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, but, but that's awesome that you mentioned that because that's kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight. We're, we're going to be talking about some battles and some victories. But, you know, one of the ones I think of, for example, is that a lot of people don't know there's a talking donkey in the Bible. You know, like, so, so these things that happen in movies and everything, that all already started from the Bible. God already laid all that out. And so that, you can find that in Numbers 22 if you want to learn, hear about that story. But... And so today I'm going to talk about one of those passages that is kind of hard to just really get our minds wrapped around. Like, man, that really happened. And so our text today, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 10. And so if you have a Bible, you can turn there. If not, we're going to have the verses up on the screen for you. But there's normally a Bible in the front seat that you can turn to. And uh, so I got four different points tonight that we're going to kind of look at. So let's just start. We're going to read verses uh, 1 through 7, and uh, we're just going to kind of lay this out. And I had, last time I taught, I, I talked about how I like to teach from where I've been reading in the Bible. And I've been reading through the Bible chronologically still, and uh, I mean, uh, just finished up Joshua not too long ago. And God had kind of just laid this passage on my heart about some victories and some battles that we go through in life. 
And so hopefully uh, it's edifying tonight. So let's just read verses 1 through 7 and we'll go ahead and get started here. In chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and now the, how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty. Wherefore Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hoham, king of Hebron, and unto Piram, king of uh, Jarmuth, and unto Japia, king of Lashish, and unto Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come on up unto me and help me that we might smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants, come up, to us quickly and save us and help us for all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. And so Joshua ascended from the Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. So we see in the book of Joshua is, is a book that the nation of Israel finally goes to the promised land. They finally get there and they start to wipe out all these nations all these um, pagan and wicked nations that they start to, to take out. And you see God miraculously working and fighting these battles and stuff for them. And so you can look in chapter 12, you can see a whole list of kings and nations that Israel had took out with Joshua as their leader. And Joshua was, he's a man of war. He's a man that was geared for battle. And uh, spiritually, we can kind of see this promised land as, our, as in a Christian life, that we can have victory too, right? We can live a victorious life. And, uh, you know, I talked about last time I taught that how Israel really fits our spiritual state, right? A lot of times we see Israel when they're up and down and they're doing good and they're doing bad, and then you just never know what, you, what Israel you're going to get. And, and we're like that a lot of times. We're real wishy-washy, especially in addiction and recovery, we just never know what version of us we're going to get, right? And so this book, this the of just them really getting to the promised land, just really shows us that it represents uh, what God has done for us, that we can have victory just like Israel did. And so, you know, God simply just didn't hand over the land to them and wipe out these nations. They still had to go battle and they still had to fight. So my first point tonight is that God allows persecution for his people. Right. He allows those things. And, uh, you know, we were talking in our Job class that, you know, does God allow or does he appoint the suffering to Job? And it really just kind of really, you know, set on my heart, you know, that a lot of times God, no matter what, he allows the things that happens in our life, whether they're appointed or not. He definitely at least allows them. And so has anyone here, have you ever heard how, you know, God won't give you more than you can handle? Have you heard that? Well, I'm sorry to tell you, but that's simply not true. That, that saying that God will not give you more than you can handle or more than you can bear doesn't really line up with what the Bible, because if you can do that, if you can handle it yourself and not the God wants to give you more than you can handle, because that way you can rely on him and not rely on yourself. And so a lot of people take that out of context, out of a different verse. And so if we had a rely on ourselves, then we can never get the victory. And this story is a prime example of that, of how God does that for us, that he fights for us. And so you hear those kind of sayings and it's like, well, you know, it's a good thought, but it's really not true that he does give us more and he wants us to rely on him only. And so Jesus himself said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, right? We can't get rest on our own. We can't do this on our own. And so it's a good thought, but 
I've just, uh, I've never really agreed with that saying. And so let's go ahead and, uh, you know, lay out this passage a little bit, kind of talk about this. In verse one, we see this, this king of Jerusalem, his name, Adonai Zedek. And for his name, you would think Adonai, you know, that's a, it's a name of God. And, you know, you would think that this is a good king, but his name means my Lord is righteous. And so for him, he is Lord. He, he, he is not a righteous king. This is a self-righteous king here. And so his, some, a lot of times the name tells a lot about who the character is in the Old Testament and even the New Testament. You know, some of these people in the Bible, you don't really hear a lot about, but you can study out their name and what it means and you can learn quite a bit about them. And so this king, he's a self-righteous king. And so that's something that we need to be careful of. We can't be self-righteous. We need to rely on the righteousness of God. So this king, he heard about the things that Israel was doing, right? This taking out these nations, wiping them out. You know, word spreads fast. And so best believe in your life, especially the lost people, they're hearing about the things that God's doing. They're, they're seeing that, you know, you're going to life issues and God's changing your life and, you know, you're trying to live for him now. And people are seeing that. And so we need to be aware of that, that they know what's. So this Adonai Zedek, he heard that they destroyed. Now, this name of the city, a lot of people say A.I., and if you pronounce it like that, I'm not going to say it's wrong. I don't necessarily know, but I, as my understanding of it, it's, it's A-E, but we see it as A-I. But I just kind of had a thought that, you know, we need to study that out sometime that they made peace with Israel, but they were kind of a little tricky about it, that they didn't come out straightforward. They wasn't quite truthful. But now that they are together and that they made peace, this other king and all these other kings of the, the, was it the Amorites? They want to destroy Gibeon, Israel, and they want to destroy Joshua. So, you know, the thing is, is that sometimes we were able to make peace with our enemies. In Proverbs 16, 7, it says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Right? Now, this king, he had fear. It said that he feared greatly. But this wasn't the fear of the Lord. This wasn't the fear that we should all have. Because remember, he thought he was Lord. He was righteous. He was the one to be feared. So we see that King Adonai Zezek has to recruit some other kings and nations to even, to even think that he has a chance He's got to get some recruit. He's got to get some help. So they gang up against this great nation. But at the end of the day, they're not really fighting against Israel or fighting against Gibeon. They're fighting against God. And a lot of times that's how it is in our life. When we're going through these things and we just don't want to submit, we're struggling. We, we, we're fighting against God. When, we try to, when God's trying to do something in our life, have you ever heard like the sayings like, uh, your arms are too short to box with God. You can't, fight, you can't fight against God. God's going to win every time. But He's also going to fight for you if you allow Him. And He's going to win these battles for you. And so if you ever feel like that, people gang up on you in life and like they want to pick on you or, you know, they're really not fighting against you. They're fighting against God too. So this verse 7, I, I really like this verse. It says, Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. Joshua doesn't, doesn't hesitate. He doesn't falter. He doesn't wait around. He doesn't just, he just goes. God says, this is what's going to happen. Do not fear. Fear not. And so the cool part of this is the people of war that went with him, right? The mighty men of valor. And you know something? We're all in a war together, right? We're in a spiritual battle. And we're in it together. And two things I've always said since I've been going to Life Issues is that we, we got to have two things for recovery, right? Number one, we got to have Jesus Christ. That's first and foremost. You got to have Jesus Christ in your life. 
And then number two, we got to have people that are going through the same things that we've gone through together to help us out, right? And I know that this is a group of people that we, we rally together and we help each other out and we, you know, lift each other up when we struggle and when we relapse and we fall into the same things of our old life. So I'm really thankful for life issues in this group, this, this people of war, right? You people, your people of war, mighty men and women of valor. So let's read verse 8 now. Verse 8, what we're going to see here is, well, first we've seen that God, He allows the persecution. He allows things to happen in our life. But then here in verse 8, we see that He provides peace. He provides His people peace. And it says, Then the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them unto thy hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Not a single person, not a single one is going to be able to stand at the end of this. So even though that God allows the persecution in our life, he's going to give us peace. And, and uh, Pastor Steve has mentioned before he, that he's, he's taught on we have a peace with God, but we also have a peace of God. You know, that there's two different passages in the Bible that talks about that, where, you know, once we get saved, we have a peace with God, that we made peace with him. But then he also gives a peace of him that we have with us when we go through these times and struggle and we, we fight these battles. He gives us a peace. So we see in this verse, these words, fear them not. And the, the phrase, fear him not, fear them not, fear not, and fear ye not, occurs 77 times in the Bible. So I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, just, you know, seven being the perfect number from God. And so it's a double set of sevens that fear not. You know, we all have fears in this life. At some point or another, we've all feared something. And something that we often fear is we have the fear of missing out, right? That the people in our old past and our old life and or they're going out having a good time and they're enjoying the, the things of this world. Sometimes we have a fear of missing out. They call it FOMO, right? Well, with Christ, we can have the joy of missing out. We can, be, we can be glad and be happy that we're not part of that old life anymore. So what, what is the opposite of fear? We should all know this, right? What's the opposite of fear? Faith. Faith is the opposite of fear. And so just like Joshua had faith that God was going to win these battles for him in Israel... We need to have faith that God is going to win the battles for us in our life. So every battle that we go through, every single thing that we struggle with, no matter what it is, there's a range as long as, as you can name them. God has delivered the victory into your hand. There is not one battle that you cannot overcome. God has given you everything you need to succeed. And so this verse, this, this in this passage, it kind of makes me think of this song I've been listening to lately by Toby Mack. Uh, Toby Mack, you know, he's been doing songs for a long time. He's like, I think he's like 50 something, but I like a lot of his music. And, but he's got this new song called Help Is On The Way. And I don't know if anybody's ever heard it, but the, some of the lyrics go like this. And I'm not going to sing it because I'll be embarrassed. But it says, it may be midnight or midday. It's never early, never late. He gonna stand by what he claim. I've lived enough life to say, help is on the way. Help is on the way. Help is on the way. I lived enough life to say, help is on the way. You know, and, and this really just kind of leads into the next point because it says he's gonna stand by what he claims. What God says is gonna happen is gonna happen. And so our next point here is that God keeps his promises to his people. So in verse 9, let's read verses 9 through 11 now. And it says that Joshua, therefore, came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Haran and smote them to Azekah and unto Makedah. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Haran 
that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Hezekiah, and they died. And they, they were more which died with hailstones than they which were the children of Israel slew with the sword. So in verse 9 we see Joshua says he came unto them suddenly. He didn't wait around. He took action. Joshua was a man of action. And so sometimes in our life we, we wait too long when God is calling us to do something. Sometimes we want to we wanna do it on our own time when God is saying, no, go now. He's calling you to salvation or he's calling you to baptism or he's calling you to start serving in ministry. Whatever it is that he's calling you to do, Sometimes we want to wait too long, and then by that time the door might be closed. That God may have moved on from you. He might have had someone else that moved into that position. So sometimes we do need to wait, though. We do need to make sure that God is doing this in our life. But then there's other times that we just need to go when He calls us. And we can't hesitate. We've got to go suddenly. We've got to take action. You know, tomorrow is not promised and we don't know when the Lord's going to return. So why should we wait to do the things that God has called us to do now? So we see that it's no surprise in verse 10 what, that God did what he said he was going to do. Right? The thing is that God is a promise keeper. And we're often a promise breaker. It's very hard for us to keep our word. But God is always going to keep his word. It says he uh, discom discomfited the en enemy. And, you know, the Bible has some words that's like, you know, I'm not good at English and grammar anyway. So then the Bible has some of these words that say and understand. But, you know, with the Spirit of God, sometimes what our pastor says, he says you got to handle the sword properly. That if you don't handle the sword properly, you're going to get cut, right? If you grab it the wrong way, if you have a sword and you grab it the wrong way by the blade, it's in any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Just like Steve was talking about, our hearts that got to be right. What's your intents of your heart, right? So let's, let's finish up this passage here in verses 12 through 15. And, and this is kind of the coolest part of the passage to me. This is where the kind of the unbelievable part kind of comes in. And so I remember like, reading through this before and like not really understanding this, but you know, after this time reading through it, I really kind of, God laid this on my heart that this wasn't something that God just did. Joshua had said this. So let's read these verses here, 12 through 15. It says, Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. They like that before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. And Joshua returned, all, returned and all Israel with him unto the camp to Gilgal. So, you know, this is like something that has happened where you see in a movie that time freezes and like they go to move their part, move them around or something, do funny, something funny to them, you know. Uh, but this passage, among others in the Bible, brings up much ridicule from skeptics. You know, some believe that this proves that the Bible, he created us, he can control us. So what's really cool is that even ancient history supports this claim missing somewhere. And then if we go back, this ends up on July 22nd on a Wednesday. So it's the same date, but a different day. So where does that day have gone? Well, it's right here. And there. it just means it's like in the sky. So there's three different heavens. There's the, you know, so the second heaven is like the atmosphere. So this is where the sun would have been st standing. And, you know, Jesus' cross was on the, was on the cross for about a day. The sun is unchanging, just like Christ is. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The sun is the central pivot point for all the other planets that rotate around. And, and so Christ needs to be the central point in our life. 
Our life needs to revolve around His, not the other way around. You know, the sun radiates light. Jesus Christ is the light. And so His light, though, is so much more brighter than you can ever imagine than the sun ever being. Jesus Christ is called the Son of God, and we have this passage from Malachi that shows the Son of Righteousness. Malachi 4.2 says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as cows, calves of the stall. Isn't that an amazing thing, that we know Jesus Christ gives us healing? So we see a lot of comparison to the sun in the sky and the Son of God. So then we have the moon. And, you know, the moon, all that really is good for is to reflect the sun. That is what the moon is a picture of, is the church, the believers in Christ. So we are to f reflect him. The moon is outside of the earth, of or of the world, so it's separated, just like we're supposed to be separated from the world. We're not supposed to be part of the world. We're not supposed to be partaking of the things that we used to in the world. And so it says here that the moon stayed. It didn't go anywhere. It held fast. So my question tonight is, are we staying? Are we staying with the Lord? Are we staying with what Jesus Christ is doing in our life? In Hebrews 10.23, it says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. A lot of times in addiction, we waver. We're here, then they're there. God doesn't want that. He wants us to, to hold fast our profession. So we see the sun stood still and the moon stayed. And Jesus' cross stood still on the cross for us. So we need to stay with him. So this is my last point that we see when we wrapped up in these few verses is that, that God provides his people with power. With his power, not just, not just any kind of power, but the power that can only come from the Holy Spirit, from God. So what we see in John 1.12, this is, this is just an amazing verse. It says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Jesus Christ is the son of God, but we have the opportunity to become sons of God. Isn't that amazing? And now I don't want to be, you know, put, let, put out the women because it just means, encompasses children, everybody. So we're sons of God, but we are all, men or women, if you're saved, we are all part of his family. We see here it says that there was no day like it before it or after it. You know, this was a special day. This was a unique day. This did never happen before. It never happens again. You know, scientists will try to disprove it, but God's word proves it. We don't need science. Science does not need to prove the Bible. The Bible itself proves it. So does anyone in their life have a day like that they can think of, that there was a day in your life that was like no other? I'm sure we all have times where we can look, at the, look in our past and say, man, that was a crazy day, whether good or bad. So I hope all of us here have a day in our life that we can pinpoint to and we can say, that was the day that I got saved. That should be a day for all of us. That should be a unique and special day for all of us. The day that I got saved, the day that I cried out to God and accepted Jesus Christ into my life. But sometimes we have some other days. And so I have an example like, for me, the day that I got out of prison after being locked up for seven years was kind of a really special, unique day. You know, it was just a feeling that I knew God was just, he had released me early from my sentence and it was just an amazing thing. And so we all have days like that. And it says that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of the man and, and that he never did that again. Now, it doesn't mean that he doesn't hear our prayers. And this also doesn't mean that God gave up his authority or power that he just didn't bow down to Joshua. That's not what it's saying here. He didn't give up his authority and power, but he put it on display because he fought for Israel. That's what the verse says. He fought for him. And he's going to fight for you too, if you allow him. If, if you're so stuck though on just doing the things on your own and you don't allow God and you don't allow Jesus Christ to, and the Holy Spirit to work in your life, 
then those battles aren't going to be won. Only God can do those things. So what we see in verse 15, and wrap this up here, it says that Joshua and Israel returned. Right? They returned. I pray that if you're in a state today that you're, you're not doing well, you're, you're in your addiction, you're living in a life of sin, that you can return to the Lord. At any time, He's just waiting for us to want us to come back to Him. You know what? I really just kind of think about this. This is recovery. Because what recovery means, it means to return to a normal state of health or mental state. Return to a normal state in our addiction. It is not normal. It is not a normal thing to be living like that. Not according to God. That's not what God wants. And so, you know, I don't, I don't want to knock anybody that says this or does this, but, you know, oftentimes people get saved and they, they come into life issues or any other kind. Of, a lot of times they come from AA and stuff. And they'll, they'll introduce themselves and they'll say, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I'm, a, I'm an addict. I'm, uh, you know, whatever the case may be. Some, and a lot of people will say, once an addict, always an addict. You know, I just don't believe that. I'm sorry. I think that's another lie. I think it's another lie that the devil wants to tell you. Once an addict, always an addict. I don't believe that. I believe that God can heal you and recover you. And you, you're always going to be a sinner. Don't get me wrong. But you don't, ever have, to, you don't have to have that title. He says that we can be sons of God. That verse that we just read. That I believe God gives his power over addiction. And we're now sons of God. And so I pray that we can all hold on to that title instead of saying, I'm an addict. You know, if you're, if you're a believer... You don't have to have that title anymore. So that's kind of my four points there is God allows the persecution. He allows those things to happen in our life. God provides peace to his people. God keeps his promises. And most importantly, though, God gives us his power. And so for small group tonight, maybe we can talk about some of the victories or battles that we've that we've been in and had victory over that God has given us, or maybe we have battles that we're still struggling with and that we want to see victory. So that could be a topic of discussion. Whoever's doing a small group tonight, you, you know, that's just a suggestion, but um, that's all of my points that I have for tonight. And I really hope and pray that what I'm saying tonight isn't just my, these aren't my words. These are God's words. And this is his words from his passage that I really hope that you can apply to your life. Because he's given me victory in so many things. And I know he can give you victory in so many things if you allow him. So I'm going to pray. And we'll have snack. And so I believe we still have snack this way, I think. I think the kitchen's a little bit busy, possibly. And then the men tonight, we are not going to meet over here on this side for small group. We're going to go over here on this side of the building. We'll either be in the Berean room or the library. And then I believe the women are still meeting in the common grounds. So let's pray, and uh, we'll enjoy the rest of our night. Dear Lord God, uh, Lord, I just uh, thank you for this day. I just uh, give you the praise that you deserve, Lord. Uh, Lord, I just uh, I can't put into words how awesome and amazing and what a blessing it is that you give us victory, Lord. And I pray tonight that everyone here has had that victory, and they can understand that, Lord, and they can know that you are fighting for them. And that if there's someone here tonight, Lord, that if they've never accepted you and your son, Jesus Christ, if they've never bowed the knee and, and just uh, submitted to you, Lord, and submitted what your son, Jesus Christ, has done for us, Lord, then I pray that they do that tonight, that they understand that that's the only way for recovery. It's the only way to get out of the life of sin and crazy things that we go through. And I just pray everyone here, Lord, under the sound of my voice is, has had that opportunity. They've had that special day in their life, Lord. They, they've uh, called out to you and repented of their sins, and they just accepted what you did on the cross. And so, Lord, I'm thankful for the, the victory of all, over all of our addiction, Lord. And I pray that we all can claim that, Lord. We're sons of God, Lord, and you've given us that power to do so. So, Lord, we just thank you, and we just love you. We just ask that you just bless the food to our bodies tonight, Lord. 
and help us to have good and open conversations in small group. Lord, we just love you so much, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And goodbye to Facebook.